It's really encouraging seeing the recovery of the plants in this system in lots of places, but the animals, the fauna are gonna take longer to come back. It's still early days on a long road to recovery and it, it will come back different than before. Following the fires, one of the first areas to show major recovery was grass tree plains like this one in Cape Connor and Coastal Park. Grass trees survive fire, they sprout very quickly after fire, and in the first spring after those major fires, put up these amazing flower stalks that just cover the landscape in the year after the fires. But now we're getting all the other plants coming up like this golden spray, like some of the melaleucas, We've even got marsh flowers that are coming as waters return to the landscape. So the two wet La Nina years have been really important in helping this system recover. The black summer fires came through Banksia woodlands like these in Cape Connor and Coastal Park. Now, in some cases, it just burnt the trunks of some of these ancient old Banksias. In other cases, it killed them. In some cases, they were able to re-sprout and bring back new life. But the most important thing has been that fire has set the seed in those banksia cones and all around us are the baby banksias almost two years on starting to come as the next generation of banksias in this system and they're not the only ones there's also corias hakeas heath species uh, rice flower all these other plants coming up amongst them so it's great to see these recoveries less than two years ago there was nothing here except bare earth now you can see how well that habitat has recovered. We've got a very broad diversity of different plants that have come back. The plant diversity in these heathlands is phenomenal. There's uh, a wide array of species packed into a very small space. And in some exceptional cases, we can get a one metre by one metre area of habitat that can have up to 50 or 60 different plant species packed into it. That's why these ecosystems are of such conservation significance. As well as seeing individual species, we're starting to see ecological processes returning. So there's a lot of pollinators out here, especially insects. They've been drawn into all these wildflowers that have flowered over the last month or so. And the other thing that we've also noticed is quite a lot of digging and scratching in the soil surface. And that's probably coming from a range of different species, including echidnas, bandicoots and even potentially potaroos. So that's starting up that whole process of turning the soil over, spreading some of the fungal spores that these forests rely upon. The story of recovery is a complex one. When we superficially look at some of these areas, there's a lot of green shoots, a lot of spectacular flower displays, but that's only part of the story. That's the easy part to convey. And as encouraging as it is, the more complex elements are going to take a lot longer to actually recover. So it's the ecological processes, it's the animals recovering, not just the plants. Because the fires occurred at a truly landscape scale, there's been winners and losers. We're in the Mottle Range Flora Reserve, which is special for having uh, the only naturally occurring stand of spotted gums in Victoria. After the fire, when we first visited, there was just utter devastation and we really weren't sure whether these trees would survive. One thing that's really apparent here is just how dense and vigorous the regrowth has been. Prior to the fire, this area was quite open in the understory, but as you can see, there's been this massive release of native plants that have come up and a real good diversity of different species. Interestingly, the spotted gums are actually getting their spots back. So that's been really encouraging to see and it's starting to look a little bit like what it was before the fire. One of our biggest surprises today was discovering a feeding tree that was being utilised by mm -hmm. yellow-bellied gliders. So we saw those diagnostic V-shaped notches yep. that they uh, put in and it's something that we weren't really expecting to find. And just to think that somehow the animals have survived that fire, they've survived that whole period after the fire with no food. Mm -hmm. It really uh, makes you appreciate how resilient some of these species can be. This is one of the areas that the black summer fires hit really hard. It was one of the hottest parts. Uh, when we first flew over the fires, you could see where the huge fire tornadoes had basically sucked everything up into its core 
almost two years on, you can still see the real impacts of those fires. One thing that we can see is a complete absence of canopy behind us. So all the rainforest canopy species have been pretty much obliterated. And even the eucalypts on the drier ridges, they're also suffering quite a lot. So you can gauge just how extensive that fire impact was at this location. One of the first things that comes back is all the tree ferns. So you see all this cover of tree ferns and you think, oh good, it looks like it's coming back. One of the problems with the loss of the canopy is that without that sun protection, as soon as we get to hot days like 40 degrees, those tree ferns can't survive prolonged heat. So we'll also lose the tree ferns over time. In the meantime, if we get another three or four hundred years without any fire whatsoever, we might get what we had here previously. It's going to be a bit of a gamble. We really don't know what's going to happen next with this vegetation type. So monitoring is going to be really important. What we have seen on this occasion is that there's been phenomenal recovery in the understory. So we've just got the most amazing multitude of different plants coming up, both uh, young trees as well as uh, little delicate flowers. A lot of them are adding a splash of colour to the landscape. The thing that's probably struck us the most is the it's still largely silent. The only place we're really hearing a lot of bird calls is in those small pockets that didn't burn. Before the fire, driving up to Genoa Peak, a really prominent feature were the groves of she-oaks growing along the road and they were a critical feeding resource for the iconic glossy black cockatoo. On this occasion, while we were driving up, we saw no evidence of that she-oak understory. It's been totally removed. Luckily, there's seedlings coming up, but we're probably looking at at least a decade before they start to get to any age where they're utilised by the glossy black cockatoos again. A key element of this recovery story is that we are all learning. A lot of the uh, rules and the rule books were pretty much thrown out the window. We don't really know what to expect in a lot of these ecosystems. So it's going to be a really good opportunity to uh, work with partners and other people to get the most out of research, to collaborate on recovery projects and document as much of this as we can. Because with climate change predictions, events such as this might be more and more commonplace. So we've got to make sure that we make the most of this opportunity. We learn as much as we can see what works and what doesn't so that we're prepared for next time that we can give nature a fighting chance to get through these critical events. Overall I'd say this is step one, a good step in the process of recovery to see that diversity of plant life surviving and that the seed hasn't been killed in the soil in lots of areas is really encouraging and really beautifully dramatic in spots. I think the harder stories are going to be around the wildlife returning to these landscapes. So I just see it as stage one in many stages of helping these systems that will continue to suffer the pressures of pests and weeds and climate change and other pressures, but at least the base is coming back and that's much better than, than scorched earth still two years on from the fires.